This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Well, this is really a pleasure for me. Um, I'm often having to speak or getting to speak, and uh, this evening's a, a real pleasure. I get to introduce one of my colleagues, a very distinguished uh, individual. And um, uh, he will be speaking on a very interesting uh, topic, uh, one that is of interest to all of us. And um, just to sort of give you a sense of this topic, you know, in medicine traditionally, we try and prescribe drugs for the average person. How many of you think you're average? Okay, that sets the stage for this kind of discussion because each of us is unique in, in many ways. And in uh, the ways in which we uh, metabolize drugs or any material that gets into our body uh, distinguishes us from each other in very important ways. And um, Russ is gonna talk about that this evening. But first, let me introduce you to him because uh, he's really an extraordinary individual. The other thing I want to acknowledge is that I know that most of the people in the audience are either from his family or his friends. <laughs> so I'm going to be careful about what I say. And he was wearing a cowboy hat. Oh, he still is. Yeah, I see him over there. There he is. Okay. So Russ um, uh, began his uh, education at Harvard, as many people have, and his work was primarily in biochemistry and molecular biology. Then he came to Stanford, and he received his uh, PhD in medical information sciences and his MD uh, here as well. So he's an MD, PhD. He's a real doctor. He actually had an internship and residency here. Um, but he's also a very fine scientist. Um, he's well known internationally. This is an example. He was the president of the International Society for Computational Biology. Now at Stanford, he's the uh, pre a professor of genetics, uh, a professor of bioengineering and medicine, and computer science by courtesy. He could be a professor of just about anything he wanted to be, but I think he selected those uh, uh, for his identity. And he's currently also chair of our new bioengineering department, which I think is a really distinguished role and a very important one uh, here, because it, it's, a, a f it's fueling a lot of interdis interdisciplinary work between the different physical sciences and uh, the biological sciences. Um, without any further description of this really extraordinary individual, I'll introduce him to you now and bring him to the uh, podium. He'll be talking to you this evening uh, on a very interesting topic, as I mentioned, and the title of that uh, topic is Drugs One Size Does Not Fit All. So think about your questions. We'll have a question and answer period afterwards. Russ. Thank you, David. That was very nice, and it's great to be here. What a lovely setting. This may sound like a cliche, but I, a funny thing happened on the way to my talk today. Um, my wife and I are down to one car because two of them are broken and in the shop, and uh, we, she, my wife left the car home for me because I needed to take my family to here. They're in the back. Um, but uh, she kept the keys. And, and, uh, and we've lost a number of sets of keys, so it turned out that this was the only set of keys. So I called up my very good friend, Phil Taylor, and I said, Phil, are you going to my talk by any chance? He said, yeah, we'll see you at 7. I said, well, could you get me there a little bit early? I need a ride. He, on a moment's notice, he came over, but he, his, his teenagers had the big car, and he brought a relatively small car. And I had five people plus him to... Uh... So we all squeezed in, and it all seemed fine. All we have to do is get from Menlo Park to the Cantor Arts Center, and he makes the turn onto El Camino, and he says, are those um, sirens for me? <laughs> and I said, oh no. And so, of course, we did not have enough seat belts, and I was the one without a seat belt, and the officer from the Atherton Police stopped us. I said, officer, this is a little bit of an emergency because I have, I, I said 500 people. 500 people are going are gonna to be uh, w listening to me. And my friend, please don't give him a ticket, because all he did was try to help me. Um, and so the officer said, well, you're the one without the ticket. Give me your license. And so, um, but he said, but you can't get there with this car. So he said, I have to take one of you in the back of my. Um... <laughs> so much to the chagrin of my 18-year-old son, I pointed at him and I said, son, you go in the police car. 
And so he complained a little bit, but he was a good sport. And so he sat in the back of the police car when we got an escort to the, to the Cantor Arts. I, my, my, my friend who's driving said, you know, Russ, you're lucky that you didn't make up that story about 500 people. So um, I, I just want to show you that I, I, I do have the ticket. And I'll be talking to Dean Stevenson later on in the evening about whether this falls under the line of duty or not. OK. So uh, let's, let's talk about a, a field called pharmacogenomics. And please don't let that scare you. I think we'll, we'll get you all there uh, by the end of this talk. It's, it's how genetics affects your response to drugs. And you might have a million questions, like, what would genetics have to do anything with my response to drugs? And that's really what we'll be talking about. You can kind of see it in the name, pharmaco for, for pharmacy and drugs and genetics for genes. Genes are things that are passed by heredity from your parents and their parents to you. Uh, there's a little mixing and matching, but as we all know, we get our genes from our parents. Uh, drug response is variable. Uh, David asked you who's average, and we all nobody's average. And we all know that when we get a, a medication, our physician tells us, this is what I think is going to happen when you take this medication. But we all know, both as patients and as physicians, that when you actually take the medication, what actually happens is a little bit of a, uh, of a dice roll. You might get a headache that they didn't tell you about. You might get nauseous. It might not work for you at all. It might work too well, and the dose is two or three times more than what you really feel that you need. Um, and this can be a cause of trouble. This can make patients not take their medications, even when the doctor thinks that this is the, the right thing to do. And what we'd like to do, and the big vision here, is can we get extra information about the patient so that we can make these drug prescribing decisions in a more rational way, saying, I know a little bit about you, and so I can pick the right drug, I can pick the right dose of the drug, and the chances of something bad happening will go down, and the chances of a good effect will go up. So in order to tell you about this, I have to do two little brief lessons. I have to do a brief lesson on the human genome, the DNA uh, that, that is passed from, from ch parent to child. And then I have to give a very brief introduction to pharmacology, the study of how drugs work and what they do. So first, let me start talking about the human genome. Uh, you may have uh, gathered from the popular press about five years ago, there was an announcement that the first human genome had been sequenced. What does that mean? Our genetic information is in the form of DNA. DNA is a long chemical. It's a string, it's really a string of chemicals made out of four letters, uh, A, T, C, and G. That's not important, uh, but that's, that's what the four letters, that's what the four chemicals are, are nicknamed. In the, in the human uh, DNA, there are three billion such letters in a row. They're broken up into chromosomes, so you have 23 segments. But really, those segments aren't important. You can think of the human genome as three billion letters, uh, A's, C's, and G's, and T's, in some order. And when they said it five years ago that the first human genome had been sequenced, what they meant was the three billion bases from a, a, a typical person if you will, had been determined through experimental means. And they were able to literally write down A, G, G, T, T, C, 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 A, T, G. I'll stop here. It goes on for three billion. Now, three billion sounds like a big number. If it's money, it's a big number. If it's your iPod, it's uh, even, a, even a nano iPod holds four gigabytes of music. So you can fit your genome easily on an iPod. So yes, it's a big number, but it is not an infinite number. And many of you are carrying around now, and if, and if this talk is boring, may whip out soon uh, more than three gigabytes of information that you have at your disposal routinely. And of course, on laptops, gigabytes come, come by, by the hundreds. So it's big, but it's finite. Um, three billion bases. and. Uh, these three billion bases are 99% the same in all of us. That's the second kind of surprising thing. It's not that we all have our own special three billion. 
99% of those uh, DNA letters are the same in all of us. But that remaining 1% is important. <laughs> it, it is responsible for, to, to a large degree for all the diversity of humanity. Uh, in fact, uh, sometimes when I have nothing better to do, I do little back-of-the-envelope calculations on how many human genomes are possible. And the answer is um, many, many. Um, I, <laughs> I don't want to use too many technical number words, so I'm trying to figure out. Let me say this. There's, the current estimate is that there's been a total of about 60 or 100 billion humans who have ever lived. And we can get a side conversation about that. But, and I think that's, there's a big plus minus on that. But throughout all of history on Earth, there's been about 60 billion humans. And that is less than 0.00001% of the total number of genomes that are possible. So the good news is we're not going to have to recycle any humans anytime soon. They, we will continue to be diverse for, for in the indefinite future. Now, the genome has in it genes. And what are genes? And I, and I apologize for having to get into this, but it's, it's, it's important to uh, go over. In that three billion bases, there are little segments that the body uh, interprets to turn into protein molecules. So there are about 25,000 such positions in the genome that are basically coding for protein molecules. Now, you have heard of protein molecules. These are these large biological molecules that do amazing things. Uh, they're large compared to uh, small molecules. Uh, hydrogen, water, glucose, those are small molecules. Um, proteins have tens of thousands of atoms. And they are uh, encoded for uh, by the gene, by the linear string of letters in the DNA. And it's more than I want to get into right now, but basically, the body has an apparatus that can read across all of those letters and from that synthesize a protein that does various things. And there's 25,000 of them, and they do all kinds of different things. Some of the, let me give you an example of some of these proteins. So the proteins are a string of chemicals um, that fold into a three-dimensional shape. Some famous ones might be myosin. Myosin is in your muscle. It's good at contracting. When under the right circumstances, when my brain sends a signal to my uh, muscle, there's some chemical reactions, and, a, and the myosin protein is told to contract, and it does. So that's one of the 25,000. Another one is called crystalline, lovely name. Crystalline is a transparent protein in the lens of your eye that is able to let light pass and yet have a three-dimensional structure to support the lens of your eye. So crystalline is beautiful. It helps refract light so that you can focus and do all the things that you require for your vision. Uh, much better than glass, by the way, because it can heal itself, among other things. That's a protein. Trypsin is a protein. Trypsin is in your gastrointestinal system. And when you eat a burger, like many of you may have just done up at the cafe, uh, trypsin will break down the, uh, the meat that you've eaten, which is made out of protein, into its smaller components. That actually raises a nice little side issue. When we eat proteins like from a cow, we don't reuse their proteins. In principle, we could. We could say, hey, look, the cow has made the protein that I need. I'll just use it. We actually break it all the way down to its smallest components, absorb it into our body, and then using the DNA, uh, rebuild it for ourselves. And there are probably good reasons for doing it that way. You never know, you know where that cow has been. Um, there are also proteins that I'll be talking about that are in your liver. These proteins have evolved over the last couple of million years because our forefathers and foremothers weren't always wise about what they ate. Like they saw a mushroom, uh, and they said, well, that's, you know, that's a death cap mushroom. I can't remember if that's the good kind or the bad kind. And so they eat a death cap mushroom, and your liver is the first point where things that you eat kind of filter through your, from, your, from your gut into your liver, and so it's the first line of defense for detoxification. And if you've eaten something bad, the liver has a whole bunch of enzymes that are meant to make them benign, to uh, disarm the bad chemicals, the toxins. This is important because during evolution, there was really no indication that we would start taking drugs. 
but we take drugs now, which are foreign chemicals, which for all, of our, for all our body knows are toxins. In fact, many of you know sometimes they are toxins, but they're toxins that we want to give. And so the liver will try to do things like metabolize those drugs um, in order to make them less effective at doing whatever they were supposed to do. And so those are an important set of metabolizing uh, proteins that we're going to come back to in a, in a few minutes. So we have the genome. I told you that we have 25,000 proteins or so that our genome encodes for. They're all throughout our body doing all kinds of good meritorious activities. Uh, and I've told you that 99% of the DNA and therefore by implication 99% of the proteins are sh identical. <clears throat> but that 1% of difference both in the genome and in the proteins that it makes are different. And, and therein lies a hint to why we may respond differently uh, to drugs. Now, I just want to take a small detour. Why do we have these differences? If, if we made one good human, why not just copy that human, make a clone? Uh, for, there's a number of reasons why you don't want to make clones of humans. But why over time has it happened? Sometimes it happened because as populations grew, they, they migrated away. Random things happened to the DNA that made it change one letter. A C turned into a G because of a chemical mistake or a chemical moment that changed the... Um... But if that change in the DNA was advantageous for the, for the organism, maybe it helped them get a skin pigment that gave them less skin cancer. Maybe it helped them eat a certain type of diet. Maybe it helped them drink milk even into adulthood. And therefore, it was a beneficial change and therefore, it's stuck in the population. People who had that change did well, reproduced, had a lot of children, their children had a lot of children, and before you know it, there's these changes in the DNA that have propagated. So sometimes those changes propagate because they're good and they actually help the organism, the human that is. Sometimes they're just random, and it's not that they help, but they don't hurt. And so uh, there's no pressure to take them away from the population, and so they accumulate just as our population of humans accumulates. We get DNA changes. It doesn't particularly help us, but it doesn't hurt us, and so those DNA changes persist in the population, and you begin to see more and more people who are descendants of the first ones who got those, those changes, uh, and so it, it manifests itself. But what we're left with at the end is about 1% of that 3 billion, which uh, I'm really bad at doing math on the fly. But um, so 1%, uh, Eric, what's 1% of 3 billion? 30 million or so? Yeah. So there's still 30 million places where we can be different. Um, so plenty of opportunity for differences. Uh, and so that's kind of the lesson on genetics. And I'm sure you'll have questions and we can talk about it more. What does this have to do with drug response? I promised I was going to talk about drugs. You've gotten a little hint. Well, first of all, there are two types of proteins that are very important for drug response. The first kind is the, of, are the proteins where the drug actually goes and physically interacts with that protein to change what it does. And that is the effect that your physician is hoping is going to help you. So if you're diabetic and I give you a, uh, an oral diabetes drug, I'm hoping that that's going to float to your pancreas bind the appropriate proteins and have an effect which lowers your blood sugar eventually. So there's the proteins that are the actual targets, if you will, of the drug. It's what the drug is meant to bind. The other proteins are those ones like in the liver that are not really there because for, it's not really where the drug is targeted for, but they're going to have their say in the drug because they're doing everything they can to detoxify that drug and make it inert, not active. And so um, changes in either of these types of proteins, the ones that are the target or the ones that are involved in metabolizing, might affect how the drug works for you. And in fact, there are, there are differences among the human population in both types of those proteins. I'm going to tell you some stories in a few minutes that lead to very big differences when I give the same drug to a, a set of patients. So, Hold that on the genome. Let's talk a little bit about pharmacology and drugs. So drugs in general are small molecules. In general, let's think about drugs as pills you take. You can also do IV or intramuscular. There's a lot of ways you can take 
medications, drugs. Um, I told the policeman that I was giving a talk about drugs. <laughs> and it was pointed out to me by my children that I had to be very careful about how I said that. Because it got his eyebrows up right away. Um, so, so, um, so drugs are in general small molecules. You swallow them. They go to your intestine. They get dissolved. They get absorbed into your bloodstream. They distribute throughout your body. Most of where they go doesn't care. But in the case of the diabetes drugs, some of that will go to the pancreas, and you'll get the salutary effect. They're all going to go through the liver, which might do some detoxification. In pharmacology, there are two main things we talk about for a drug. We talk about its pharmacokinetics. Forgive me for this word. Pharmaco is drug. Kinetics is moving, like kinetic. So it's how the drug moves around. And then pharmacodynamics, which is what the drug does. Um, the, the way I teach the medical students is that pharmacokinetics, how the drug moves around, is what the body does to the drug. How does it shuttle it around? How does it excrete it eventually? Pharmacodynamics is what the drug does to the body. So you can think of PK, pharmacokinetics. Um, I apologize in advance if I say PK as a term of art. I mean pharmacokinetics, what the body does to the drug. And then pharmacodynamics, or PD, what the drug does to the body. So if a protein is involved in the pharmacokinetics of a drug, it can end if different people have slight differences in, the, in that protein, they might move that drug around differently. Let me give you an example. There are transporter proteins in your body that transport drugs from your bloodstream into the cell. And those transporters have differences, that 1% of differences, that if I, if I got some of your DNA, I could demonstrate it right in this crowd. Some people have very fast transporters. So they take the drug, and it gets into that cell really fast. Other people have slow transporters that kind of mosey along, and the drug eventually gets in, but it's much slower. Now, I don't think you have to be a, a physician to imagine that if in one case you're getting a lot of drug fast, and in the other, drug, you're, in the other case you're getting uh, your drug over a much longer period, that your experience of that drug might be very different. And I'm going to give you some concrete examples, um, but for now let's keep it abstract. Just proteins that have differences that affect the pharmacokinetics. And of course, there are proteins that are the targets of the drugs. And if I'm a drug and if I'm binding to a protein with physical interaction, maybe I have a plus charge and that protein has a minus charge, so we attract each other. Uh, if you have a real big minus charge on your protein, but because of genetic differences, somebody else has a less minus charge, then maybe the affinity with which that drug binds that protein would be different. And again, I don't think you need to be a professional physician or pharmacist to imagine that if the drug binds its target more tightly or less tightly, that might lead to a different experience of the drug. So genes that code for PK proteins, genes that code for PD proteins, these are genes that might be uh, relevant for understanding differences in drug response. So let's go to some examples, because I think these make these concepts uh, very clear. I have three. I have a million. This is my field. I love this field. I'm, you don't want to hear a million. You want to hear three. And here's a great drug, codeine. Codeine is a great drug. It's a pain relief. And one of the great things we can do as physicians is treat people's pain. It's in Tylenol number three. So if you've had a teeth, tooth pulled, it's very likely that your dentist might have written you for some Tylenol number three. Minor surgeries, depending on what your surgeon thinks is minor, right, uh, uh, might get you some codeine. It's an opioid. Uh, and, it's a, and it's been around forever. Now, let me tell you a little bit about codeine. Codeine is metabolized by the liver into morphine. Now, we all know morphine. Right? Morphine. Oh, that sounds scary. That's the active form of codeine. If you take codeine, and if you just inject codeine into your bloodstream, there will not be an effect of, for pain relief until it reaches your liver, and your liver does a little chemistry on that codeine. It involves just 
I can't remember if it's adding or taking away one little chemical group, uh, and then that codeine is morphine, and then the morphine binds to your opioid receptors that are in your brain and, and, and even in other parts of your body, and gives you this subjective sense of less pain. Very important drug. And that translation from codeine to morphine is done by a gene, one of these 25,000. And guess what? That gene is not the same in everybody. Now, let me do a little experiment. Who here has taken codeine and really felt that they had absolutely no pain relief from the codeine? Thank you. Thank you for raising your hands. Because 7% of Caucasians have a version of, the, of that protein. Protein has a horrible name. It's called CYP2D6, clearly named by a scientist and not a physician. I wasn't involved. 2D6, I'm going to call it. So in about 7% of Caucasian people, 2D6 has a DNA change that makes it unable to turn codeine to morphine. So for those people who raise your hand, I can't prove it, but it's very likely that those people take the codeine, it enters their bloodstream, and never gets turned into morphine. And therefore, they call up their doctor and says, doctor, I had my mouth pulled, my teeth pulled, and it really hurts. Uh, and in fact, this happens to me all the time as a physician. And what do we do? We say, oh, that's odd. Maybe I should give you Vicodin. And so I give you a different uh, opioid that doesn't require 2D6, and hopefully then you get some relief. But for those two or three days, it can be a tough three days realizing that you're one of these people who doesn't respond to codeine. Now, the codeine story is extremely interesting because there are other people who have super-duper 2D6 activity. Their 2D6 proteins turn codeine into morphine in a snap. So normally, I give codeine, and I give it every six hours because it takes a couple of hours to peak its level, pharmacokinetics, how it's absorbed, and then how it's excreted, pharmacokinetics. Um, but for some people, it goes up really fast. Now, I don't probably have to tell you that these people love codeine. Okay, because it's like getting a shot of heroin in the arm. And so, in fact, there's been some suggestion that this may be related to potential for addiction. Because if you are constantly taking codeine, and everybody else says, well, codeine's okay, it makes me a little constipated, but it helps my pain. And you're saying, well, I don't know what you're talking about, the constipation. I just get this great little um, uh, high from it, a morphine high. And so, uh, and so that, that is, there's people researching that to see if that's actually the case, but there's some preliminary evidence that this may be related to some people. And I'm not going to ask who loves codeine. <laughs> you all know who you are, and maybe that's why. Um, so this is an example of pharmacogenetics. It's because we have different genetic versions of 2D6 that, when the protein is made, have slightly different physical features, and that leads to very different experiences of a commonly used drug. Now, this is important because when I tell, I, t I tell, I give this lecture to physicians sometimes, and, and I'm sorry to say, uh, and it's kind of my job to turn this around, this is not generally known by most physicians. Uh, pharmacogenetics has, is a new field. It really became possible with the sequencing of the genome, and so we haven't fully embedded it into the medical school curriculum. So I'm telling you this because if you go to your doctor and say, I'm worried about my response to codeine, uh, if you get a blank look, it's not because they're a bad doctor, it's because they went to medical school before I was lecturing on, and they didn't go to Stanford or, or, or the other places that are, that are teaching it now. Um, so, so this is a big issue, and I, actually I should, just as an aside, this is a big challenge facing medicine right now. As we're learning these new things based on genetics, there's a real challenge to how are we going to train Physicians, the new physicians, sure, we can change the curriculum, but we have a lot out there in the community, and we have to get them up to speed. And, and they, want to, they want to be the best doctor they can be, but it's a lot of new information. And so one of the things we spend a lot of time on is how are we going to do this? Okay, so that's the codeine story, and we can come back to it later if there's questions. Let me give you a second drug, and there's going to be three stories. This one is a little bit more rarely used. It's called 6-mercaptopurine. I like 6-mercaptopurine because it was invented by a woman, uh, Gertrude Ellion, who really should be a hero. Um, she was a woman working in the pharmaceutical industry before any women were working in the pharmaceutical industry. 
Uh, she worked for the Burroughs uh, uh, Pharmaceutical Company. I had the pleasure of meeting her before she died. She won a Nobel Prize, so eventually she was uh, recognized for this work. She invented uh, or discovered the effects of 6-mercaptopurine, which is used as a drug in leukemia, also in some autoimmune diseases, uh, also uh, things like um, uh, irritable, not irritable bowel, but um, uh, ulcerative inflammatory bowel diseases, a whole spectrum of things, including both cancer and autoimmune diseases. And it's a good drug. She invented it in the 40s or the 50s, and it's, it's been a great drug used in many settings. You take 6 mercaptopurine orally, and what they noticed is about 1 out of 100 people had a terrible, life-threatening response to 6 mercaptopurine uh, with deaths in, in some cases. And they didn't understand this. We give it to 99 people, and sure, they have some side effects, a little stomach ache, what, but they don't die. But one out of 100, they're dying. What, what's going on? Uh, my friend um, Dick Winchelbaum at the Mayo Clinic was, uh, it, did this work. I should give Dick credit. By the way, I didn't do the coding discovery work. That was done by others as well. I'm telling you other people's stories right now. Um, Dick wondered about this, and he said, let me go take a bunch of people from the population, and let me see if I can figure this out. And he said, let's think, what is the mechanism of action of 6-mercaptopurine? And he did a lot of science, and he identified a small set of proteins that he thought might be involved in the response to 6-mercaptopurine, one of which was a protein, another bad name, TPMT, thiopurine methyltransferase. You don't have to know that, TPMT. What he found, however, was that in 1% of the population, TPMT does not effectively metabolize 6-mercaptopurine. In the rest of the population, you take a certain amount, but as it goes through the li liver, the level of the drug is markedly reduced because there's a very quick metabolism. So only a small percentage gets out of the liver and gets to the rest of the body. In these 1%, that the liver is not effective at, at, at deactivating the, the drug. So I want to point out, in the case of codeine, we were talking about an enzyme that activated it. Now we're talking about an enzyme that de or a protein that deactivates. Okay? In those 1%, it is not deactivated, so they get very toxic levels of this cancer drug. And it's like an overdose of a cancer drug, and their bone marrow dies because it's all... These are very sensitive cells in your bone marrow, and they're all killed. They're unable to make cells to fight infection. They're unable to make blood cells for um, transporting oxygen, and they die. And so what Dick found is that you could look at somebody before you give them 6-mercaptopurine. You could get a um, genetic test, and you could say, oh, you're not a good candidate for 6-mercaptopurine because your version of TPMT is, is the inactive version that will not detoxify it. Or you can say, you're a sick person, and you need this drug, but I'm going to give you 1 20th of the dose, and then, or 1 30th, or whatever it is. You give a much lower dose, and then they have more of a typical response. And in fact, it is about 1 20th or 1 30th. So here's an example, again, a pharmacokinetic example, where the levels of the drug are being modulated by these liver proteins. And it's a different liver protein from the one that, uh, that, that affected codeine. Okay, how are we doing? We're doing good. Third and final example, which is my favorite because we're actually doing some work in this area, is warfarin or coumadin, a blood thinner. Many of you may know somebody or may yourself be on this. There are literally tens of millions of Americans on this drug. It's a blood thinner that we use for many reasons. We use it if you have clots in your legs to keep you from getting more clots so that you don't have a clot that goes to your lung and, and kills you. Some people after a heart attack get some Coumadin. Some people who have congestive heart failure or atrial fibrillation, uh, such as Bush number one, are on Coumadin. Um, people who have had clots because of smoking or because they're just unlucky and have a genetic background that makes them more likely to clot. Warfarin is used all the time, Coumadin and Warfarin, I'm going to use them interchangeably, to thin the blood, to make it less likely to clot. But there's a problem. It's an extremely difficult drug to dose. So here's a drug we're using in 30 to 40 million Americans. And when a patient comes into my office and needs Coumadin, I have no idea what dose they should get. So usually you would think, well, what about a big football player? They get more. Little old ladies, they get less. Uh-uh. Because it's not about body size in the case of warfarin. 
It's about, as I'll tell you, it's about the genetic background. So I've had little, nice little ladies who get 20 milligrams, and I've gotten football players who get two and a half milligrams, and you cannot predict it. Okay, so you can't predict it, it's an important drug, big deal, so what? Well, there are dire consequences to misdosing warfarin. If you give somebody too much warfarin, then they don't clot at all. They can get spontaneous internal bleeding. They can get spontaneous strokes. All kinds of bad things happen. This is well known. We always, when we give Coumadin to a patient or warfarin, we always explain to them the risks. We think this is a good drug, but there are a lot of risks. And if you underdose it, if you don't give enough, well, then they're not going to be anticoagulated and all the bad things that could happen with clotting. So you have what we call a very narrow therapeutic window between the level that's required for overdose and the level that was required for underdose. And so what we really need is help getting the dose of warfarin right. Now, I got to tell you, uh, there was a PK. There's a PK protein, pharmacokinetics, how it gets in and out. It's an ugly name, CYP2C9, yet a new one. Don't worry about it. There are variants in 2C9, and it's been shown that those variants explain a little bit of why some people need 2.5 and, and other people need 20 milligrams. It does by no means explains everything, and people have been looking very carefully, can we find more proteins that are also involved? And it's a great story, so I want to tell you the story. They kn and, I, and I might have some of the details wrong. Forgive me, this is an evening after dinner talk. It's basically accurate. Somebody was worried about rats, I think in the New York subway system, who were not dying from rat poison. Guess what? Certain types of warfarin are used as rat poison. Remember I said if you overdose, you have internal bleeding? Well, if you're trying to kill rats, that's a good thing, okay? So they leave little pellets of food laced with warfarin, high doses of warfarin, and the, the theory is the rats will eat the food with the warfarin, They'll walk around, and they'll get a spontaneous stroke and die of a stroke, or they'll get a spontaneous bleed internally, and they'll die, and nobody's that sad because rats are a problem, and there's no shortage of rats in New York. But the rats weren't dying. And somebody said, well, this is interesting. And somebody who's really clever said, I wonder if it's genetics. And they grabbed a bunch of rats that could eat warfarin for breakfast with no problem, and they bought a bunch of rats who were the descendants of rats that died. I mean, obviously, once you give them the warfarin, it's all over. So you have to, so you get the children of the ones that died. You make them reproduce first. You've got to do the logic right. But basically, you get ones that you're pretty sure would die if you gave them warfarin. And they did a genetic study of the DNA of these rats. And they found a rat. So rats have a genome. I won't say just like humans, even though to me it is just like humans. Uh, rats have a genome. It's a little bit different from ours, but it's a couple of billion bases um, filled with proteins, about 25,000 proteins. Uh, you'd be scared how similar we are to rats. I, I won't go there. Um, but this is a good news. The similarity is good news in this case, because they found a gene that had a little change in the DNA in the ones that could eat warfarin with no problem. And that wasn't present. That change was not present in the ones that couldn't eat. So what had happened? Some lucky rat <laughs> had gotten a mutation. And that rat could eat everything in the subway system, have lots of children. And so that mutation, so to speak, spread through the rat population like wildfire. And so now it was a, a, a considerable percentage of the population. But this researcher wasn't just worried about rat welfare. They were worried about human disease, and they were clever. Um, uh, and they said, I wonder, some of this work was done up in Seattle, I should say. Uh, I wonder if the humans have a similar gene. And I wonder if that affects human response to warfarin. We're not usually killing the humans, but we are sometimes killing them. And sometimes we're just not having a good re experience with warfarin. So they looked for the equivalent gene in the human genome. They found it. And they started doing studies of people who required really high doses of Coumadin and people who required low doses of Coumadin in order to get the right effect. And you have, there's ways that we can measure to say, this is the right dose of Coumadin. We're getting it just right. And lo and behold, the people who required high doses of Coumadin had similar mutations, similar, and I, and I say mutation in a, in a, not in a judgmental sense, right? In our, in our society, like mutant ninja turtles. In fact, I think they're good. I, mean, I don't understand mutant ninja turtles. But when I say mutation, I want to explain. I'm not talking about anything bad. I'm just talking about a change from the more, more common version of the DNA. So there were, they had changes in their DNA that were just like what the rats had. 
And so now we had the 2C9 involved in PK. It turns out that this new gene, I hesitate to mention it, VKORC1, VKRC1, the new gene, uh, is a PD. It's a pharmacodynamic gene. It's actually binding to the, to the um, Coumadin and, uh, and, and part of how it does its, its action. So they said, well, this is exciting because now we have two genes and now we are able to start to sort out the two and a half milligram people from the 20 milligram people. And wouldn't it be great if we could get to a time when a doctor prescribing warfarin gets it right on on the first try and doesn't have to send the patient home worrying that there's going to be either a bleed or a lack of good effect. Anybody who knows anybody on Coumadin knows that it's a big pain in the neck because we give the first dose and we say, you have to come back next week. We're going to do another blood test. We're going to see what your level is. We might then call you up and change your dose. And, and you might have to do that in some cases for months before we get the right dose of Coumadin. So the vision now is check the DNA, get the dose, here it is, we'll do one test just to make sure we didn't screw up, and if you're where we think you should be, we're done. So all of that worry and anxiety on both sides, physician and patient, go away. This occurred to a number of groups around the world, uh, groups in Utah, uh, in, um, in Wisconsin, in Liverpool, England, in China, in Japan. I'm just saying this to let you know the size of this issue about warfarin. Everybody cares about it who's involved in healthcare globally. And 10 different groups got about 300 or 400 patients and started to figure out how can we predict warfarin dose based on genetics. So they figured out the genes, they, they, they did the experiments to figure out which version of the genes, and then they took the age into account, maybe the weight, I'm not sure, a couple of other factors. And they came up with little equations where you plugged in all the numbers, cranked it through the computer, and you got the dose. Great. There's one problem. <laughs> the 10 groups around the world got 10 different equations. Okay? That's not good. Because we're all human. We're all looking at the same genes. It should be the same equation for everybody. What's going on? And the feeling was the statistics were not powerful enough. 300 people was not enough people to really have, as, as we say in engineering, small error bars. That is to say, a lot of confidence. We said, well, this is what we think, but there's a lot of uncertainty in our estimate. So um, I'm running a database uh, called PharmGKB that contains pharmacogenetic information. And I, this came to my attention, and I said, guys, why don't we pool 300 from you, 300 from you, 300 from you, uh, and put it all together and now come up with the mega global warfarin dosing strategy. And to my shock, they agreed. They said, okay. So I said, uh-oh, now I got to do it. But this has been going on. So this is a work in progress. I'm happy to report. So we, have, we, we, we formed the IWPC, the International Warfarin Pharmacogenomic Consortium. And it has global membership. It's ex very exciting. The, the thing that's exciting is we have calls that are like at 11 a.m. here, and my poor colleagues in Japan are calling at 3 in the morning or something. And, but we're all excited. We've pooled the data. There's a lot of technical stuff to make sure that apples are apples and oranges are oranges. You can imagine a lot of like, do you do the weights in pounds or kilograms? Because that's going to matter, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we're getting to the point that in the next few months, we think we're going to have this dosing equation and what are you going to do with it? Well, first you make sure it works about the same in all populations, and then you do the big test. You do a trial where you prospectively, that is, people come to you who are starting warfarin, you check their genetics, you crank it through the algorithm, and you say, you're going to get 10 milligrams, and you do that, and you compare that to current business as usual, which is the come back every week. Um, you do this in a way that everybody's safe and that nobody's in extraordinary danger. Uh, and what you hopefully show is that side effects, visits to the hospital, total cost of care, and efficacy, general efficiency of care is up in the people who have genetic testing uh, compared to those who don't. So that's going to be happening in the next year. Um, we're all crossing our fingers. There's stuff that can go wrong, but we're all very committed to this. And so this is uh, hopefully going to be one of the first global pharmacogenomic interventions that we'll be able to point to, and the hope is, is if it's a success, they'll just, lots of drugs will start falling. This kind of story will be replicated for other drugs. The kinds of drugs we're looking at, just to give you a sense of other consortia, tamoxifen, it's used in breast cancer. 
The, the response to tamoxifen is very variable among different women who are taking it, and there's an opportunity to check the genetics there. Um, asthma, asthma treatment, some people take those puffers and they do great, and others actually get worse. Is that a genetic background? Can we pool data? So there's a lot of this activity, and this looks like where a lot of activity is going to be going for the next, um, for the next few years, uh, and it's very exciting. So these are three examples, and as I said, there are many others, uh, but the overall goal of pharmacogenetics is to figure out what are the genes encoding for those proteins that are important. I didn't go into the details, but sometimes there are genes that don't code for proteins that do other things that are also important. So we really have to look through all three billion bases, pretty much. Um, but I want to say a little bit more, because if I just left you with genetics, that wouldn't be fair. The title of the talk, what is the title of the talk? One size does not fit all. And there's another major reason why one size does not fit all. Genetics is a huge reason. And this is my passion, and this is what we're looking at. But there's also something called lifestyle and habits. And guess what? Lifestyle and habits, especially what you eat, can affect your response to drugs. So some of you may know that if you have been unlucky enough to have a friend or a child swallow something that they shouldn't have swallowed, a lot of times you'll go to the emergency room and they will give you charcoal, they call it, which is you swallow it and sometimes it makes you vomit. But another thing that it does is it binds the, the drug that you've just taken and prevents your body from absorbing it. So that's a great example of if you were in the habit of eating charcoal on a regular basis, which I don't recommend, and this is not burning charcoal. This is another kind of charcoal. Let's not go out and eat uh, briquettes. Um, but what you eat can have an effect on the availability of those small molecule drugs to even be absorbed into your body. And so um, a great example is grapefruit juice. And some of you who are on medications may know, maybe your doctors have told you, don't take grapefruit juice. It turns out that grapefruit juice has, a, medi has, a, has a, um, a component in it. You know, it's a mix of lots of different things. But one of the things in it um, is an inhibitor of one of those CYP enzymes that I was talking about before. It blocks the ability of that enzyme to interact with anything else. So if you're depending on that enzyme to either detoxify a drug or to activate a drug, it's not going to behave as you expected if you've just had a big glass of grapefruit juice. And there are lots of other drugs. In the case of Coumadin, green leafy vegetables. What could be more healthy than green leafy vegetables? The problem is green leafy vegetables have some components that are antagonistic with the effects of Coumadin. And so anybody who's on Coumadin knows that their doctor has told them it's not that you shouldn't eat vegetables, but you should keep your, do your dose of vegetables. See, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like a, you should keep the amount of vegetables you eat very stable because if you go up and down and you have a huge salad for a week and then you don't eat anything, then it'll be impossible to get you on a stable dose of, of warfarin. So just as, my, uh, even though I love the genetics, there's also this other part, this environmental lifestyle that can also affect your response. There's one other thing that's environmental that I think is so cool. And this is the bacteria that live in your gut. So you probably all know your uh, colon is filled with uh, guests, lots of E. coli, lots of other bacteria. And m most of those are actually there in a, a symbiotic relationship with you. They get something out of it. You know, you take them around and drop them off. Uh, <laughs> But they also do things for you. They can break down some foods that you can't break down. And sometimes they actually try to help you with your drugs. But this is a problem for me. So I do a drug test. So there are bacteria that can break down drugs just as good, if not better, as your liver. Well, and the bad news is we don't all have the same bacteria. So that causes me a problem because I might check somebody's genetics and say, well, this person looks like they're going to be a super duper fast metabolizer of this drug because I checked their genes and it looks like their gene, that, that protein is going to be fast. But wait a minute, maybe they have a bacteria that slows it down. In fact, maybe the bacteria eats it up before it ever gets absorbed and there's nothing for the liver to do. And so the interplay of the flora and the fauna in your GI tract with your genetics is something that we really have to understand before we fully get the story on variation in drug response. And there, there's, a, there's actually a, a field called nutrigenomics, 
which is the interaction of nutrition and, 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 and small molecules that you eat with your genome and the overall kind of integration of all influences, what you eat, what's growing in your gut, and what's going on um, genetically. So I'm a big fan of the genetics. I think it's responsible for a lot of the variability, but it would be misleading of me not to point out that what you eat is key. We all know as physicians that when we give a prescription, the big question is, will the patient even fill it, and will they take it once they fill it? Um, that's not even clear. Then it, what is the patient eating and, and, and other things? Okay. So two more short points, and then we'll finish up. The National Institutes of Health uh, funded by your taxpayer money, has noticed the importance of pharmacogenomics and has been very generous in the last seven or eight years since the genome kind of became clear that it was going to be finished at funding pharmacogenomics research. There's a lot of pharmacogenomics in companies, but the thing about companies is they don't share their results. They don't have to. They're there to make money. I understand that. But we need to train young scientists in how to think about these principles. And NIH said at least some of the research that's done needs to happen in the public domain with people at universities or nonprofits who are going to be publishing these results. And so um, this is particularly important for the NIH because there's a big push these days for what we call translational medicine. When is the basic research going to get itself into routine practice. And as you can see, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about taking basic genetic knowledge, knowledge of how drugs are, work and how they're metabolized, and turning that into changes in medical practice that will benefit patients. So translational medicine, if you haven't heard that, that phrase, is a very important push for NIH. It's a push at Stanford Medical School right now, and you'll probably be hearing more about it. And I'll just submit to you that pharmacogenetics is, a, is an important element of translational medicine. The other thing I really need to mention are the ethical issues involved here. I've, I've skipped over this. I've been a little bit Pollyanna about, wow, this is going to be a great world. But there are things to worry about. So your genes are pretty much the same for your whole life. So in principle, I could, when you were born, take some of your DNA, figure out all of the DNA sequence, the three billion bases, stick it on an iPod or a DVD or whatever, Who's going to hold that genetic data? That worries a lot of people. Because not so much that you don't trust your doctor will do that. Maybe you don't. But probably your doctor is going to do meritorious things with it. But what about your employer? Should your employer have access to your genetic background? Should your employer know that codeine doesn't work for you and you might need the much more expensive Vicodin? And should they consider that when they're hiring you? Well, this person, if they ever have pain, is going to be more expensive to treat. Now, I'm being a little facetious, but you can imagine other situations where they would say, wow, that's something that could be really expensive. So is there an opportunity for discrimination? There clearly is an opportunity. And so um, I think it's important to think about the medical systems, the security systems, the, and the social rules that govern the use of genetic data. You may know that in the Senate right now is a bill, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA, uh, very close to being passed. It's, I don't know, day-to-day -day basis. It, it, there's been a lot of positive votes recently. I don't know if it's formally passed. But GINA goes a long way to saying if people have genetic information, it should be used for their benefit, and it shouldn't be used to discriminate them. I'm a huge fan of GINA. I've written editorials in favor of it. Um, and if you meet... Uh, uh, your congressperson or your senator, maybe you want to mention that gene is an important thing. Actually, our senators in this area are, are with the program. There's also ethical issues with the drug companies because they want to make money, and there's, they have a love-hate relationship with pharmacogenetics. Why do they love it? They love it because a drug that could be failing trials might be saved because you say, oh, it's only this 1% or 10% of people that have this terrible side effect. We'll check them genetically, and as long as we have a patient that doesn't have that genetics, we can use the medication. So there's already been drugs that have been saved, so to speak. They were going to be killed, but they found out that there was a subpopulation, which you could identify genetically, that did OK. And so they said, OK, it's not our first choice, but we'll test people, and then we'll use it on the subset for whom it will be beneficial and we won't use it on those who would have a bad effect. But there's a flip side to that coin, which is the drug companies like to sell to everybody. They like one size fits all. 
they want you all to buy codeine. Um, because then they make, this is Johnson & Johnson, tunnel number three. Johnson & Johnson wants us all to prescribe codeine. Uh, and they're not that into the idea of coming up with genetic tests so that once and for all you know you should never take codeine again. Because I'm sure that you forget that codeine didn't work sometimes and you might buy some more without really realizing what you're doing. And so they have this love-hate because yes, it can save drugs, but yes, uh, it will fragment their market. And they don't like market fragmentation. The thing that's, I, I really don't have any evidence that they would ever do this, but another thing that's potentially possible is what happens if different ethnic groups have different types of genetic changes? We know that that's true. We know that there are small differences. We all have the same variations, but the frequency of some variations is higher in Chinese Americans, lower in African Americans, medium for Caucasian Americans, whatever. What happens if the drug company starts thinking, well, the type of people that have money to buy our drugs tend to have these types of genetics. Let's develop drugs for them. I don't really like that logic. Uh, I think Gina will help. And in general, we have to just have our antennas up that we don't have this kind of actuarial calculation. Or if we do, make sure that everybody's comfortable with it. So there's a lot of stuff we could talk about. But I do want to highlight that there are ethical issues, not just in pharmacogenetics, but any time genetics is being used for decision making, because it can be used for medical decision making, but it can be used for a lot of other decision making. Not so much to prove that somebody is going to have something happen, but to alter the probabilities that something may happen. And that information can be used by clever people to kind of, you know, um, uh, get an advantage over the house, so to speak, if you're a fan of uh, Vegas. So let me finish up. Uh, genome, 99% shared, 1% difference. Those differences are really important. That's why we're all different. There are proteins in that genome that are involved in the PK of a drug or the PD of a drug. Changes in the DNA lead to changes in those proteins that lead to different PK, different PD, and then just in those cases of codeine, warfarin, and 6-mercatopurine, a very different response. And really, maybe for all drugs. Pharmacogenomics is studying these genetic differences to try to understand them. We hope the good side, the upside is increased utility and good use of drugs, decreased side effects and bad use. There are ethical issues that we have to be mindful of, and the environment still matters. What you eat still matters, and what is growing in your body still matters. But we still, I think, can get a hold of all those things and look to a time when we're dosing our drugs optimally so that we'll have a different size for everybody. So thank you very much. Thank you, Russ. Now we have time for some uh, questions. I brought all my genomes up here. <laughs> you mentioned the very fast effect of codeine and no effect. How do you explain the effect when someone gets nausea and vomiting with codeine or Vicodin? So side effects come in two types. One type of side effect is the effect of the drug that you're actually looking for, but it's kind of overdoing it. And other side effects are totally separate effects of the drug that are not really why you're taking it, but we accept that because it's a... It, so I, I want to try to be clear about this. You have the main target protein. That's the thing that you really are giving you the codeine, so the opioid receptor. And you, you bind the opioid receptor, and the opioid receptor is responsible for your perception of pain. There are other opioid-like receptors that are involved with how fast food moves through your bowel. The codeine also binds them because it's close enough. And then you get this constipation as a side effect. It has nothing to do with binding the pain receptor that you really care about. It's binding something else as a little side moonlighting job. Uh, but that's the moonlighting that causes you all kinds of problems. Now, you can have the pharmacogenetics because of variations in the, tar the main target, but you could also have a variation in the intestinally related target, and so that could be two separate effects. You could be very unlucky where codeine doesn't work at all on pain, but works great at constipating you. I guess I had three points. The first being, how do you explain the action of topical drugs? Because um, you didn't really address yes. that. Um, the second question is kind of, why do different countries have different regulations? Because in <laughs> Australia, you can buy panadine, which is a panadol plus codeine, over the counter. 
And then I guess just my third point, you know, in terms of educating the older doctors, how about a bunch of webinars? But maybe yes. if you can address questions one and two. Okay, so number one was, uh, remind me. Number one was how about topical drugs topical and drugs. how do they work? So topical drugs are bypassing the intestine, obviously. But uh, so they get absorbed directly into the skin and therefore they can enter the bloodstream directly. Eventually they will go through the bloodstream to the liver and therefore the liver will still have a crack at it. But there is a di very different pharmacokinetics from when you take a pill because the pill, it's a mandatory trip through the liver right away. Whereas for topical, you get a little bit of circulation before it gets to the liver. So this is why, for example, uh, when we used to use a, uh, estrogen a lot for women, there was oral estrogen and there was an estrogen patch, and the doses were extremely different because the oral was going through the liver, the, the patch was already going throughout the body, and it only went to the liver later. And so in general, you gave lower doses on the patch than you took orally. So that's... So, so topical is, it's more complicated, but it's the same principles of how it gets in and how it gets out and where it's acting, PK and PD. Second question about why different drugs have, different companies, uh, different countries have different rules. It's totally about politics and money, okay? They have their own organizations. Those organizations, organizations take pride in their mechanisms for doing approvals. They have slightly different criteria but these are not like good or bad. This is just very slight differences in what's required from the drug company to get the evidence. Uh, and, and so what happens is that drug companies, they have huge banks of people who are experts at all their different markets. And it's very common for a drug to quickly get approved in one country and to have a lot of trouble in another country. The EU is now working together. So you can go for Europe all in one fell swoop. U.S. is covered by the FDA, and then Japan and China have obviously separate ones. Those are the big markets. Um, and then the third question. Yeah. Question over here. Uh, thank you for this. It was really interesting. And I, my question has to do with neurology. Are there uh, specific things going on in terms of... Um, interactions with idiopathic seizure disorders, that kind of things? Yes. So neurology um, is a, uh, you said neurology, right? Yeah. So neurology is a very important, uh, and there's a lot of optimism about this pharmacogenetics helping, uh, specifically in like the big disorders, which are epilepsy, depression, schizophrenia. Um, we are not particularly good at treating those diseases. And sometimes we get people who have miraculously good responses to, say, an anti-schizophrenic drug or an antidepressant. And then we have the same drug, and it's just a miserable failure for other people. And so it could be what they're eating. It could be their gut flora. But there's a big suspicion that genetics is a lot of it. And I have colleagues who have already found some proteins that are involved, for example, in the metabolism of Prozac. And there's a study going on right now looking at people who have one version of this and people who have another version. They're all depressed, and they're seeing if they have a different response to Prozac based on that. If that trial is successful, we'll have a little bit of information about how to use Prozac um, a little bit more uh, judiciously. So this is a, a big area, schizophrenia as well, and, and the anti-epileptics. Another big area that I should say is cardiology with arrhythmias. There are drugs that people have been taking for diabetes, that's which is I'm, what I'm interested in, for years and years and years and years. Then somebody goes in and looks at all the data, massages it. I'm talking about Avandia in particular, yeah. and says, oh my God, it's terrible. How, 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 how much faith can you put in that kind of thing? So the, the, yeah. So the, 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 I have a lot of concern about the cases recently of drugs being withdrawn the mar from the market uh, because of very rare side effects. So the, the famous one is Vioxx. I'm a physician, and when Vioxx was recalled from the market, did my patients come in and dump their pills on my desk and say, oh, thank goodness, I don't I'm not going to use... No, my patients came and said, it's going off the market in a month. Could you please give me a prescription for 5,000 of them? And that was because for them, the benefits of Vioxx, first of all, they knew that it was a 1 in 10,000 or a 1 in whatever chance of some bad effect. They hadn't had the effect. They had been on the drug for years. And they said, this is a good drug for me. Avandia, which is a diabetes medicine, which some of you may know, um, it had a sister drug that was withdrawn because of liver failure. 
That was bad. We don't want liver failure. We thought we'd finally found a version of that drug that was really going to work well. It really can help diabetic. And, and now there's a question. It, the question of withdrawal came up because of cardiac problems as well. Um, I feel that pharmacogenomics might be the answer. I can't claim in either of those cases that it's proven. It's not. But I, my hope is that if we go back and look at that data, we will find genetic reasons where that we could have said to that small group, I'm sorry, but you're just at too much risk to take this medication. But for the rest of the world, they'll be able to use it. That was the example that I was talking about before where we fragment the market, but it allows us to save the drug. Because right now, FDA has a very blunt inf instrument. It can only say yes to the drug or no. And what it's now looking at is yes if you test. And that would be a very interesting world, which we're not quite to, but they're beginning to look at that. Another question in the back there. Uh, my mom takes Coumadin. I'm wondering if there's some way that she can benefit from some of your research. So where does she live? Uh, <laughs> Southern she, California. So um, L.A. Uh, County. So the thing now is basically to do current care because since it hasn't been proven to be so, it is it is it is um, irresponsible to recommend a change in the standard of care until it's been proven by adequate studies. We are working very hard to get those studies done because we know that there's a lot of people who this may affect. So I think the best thing to do is to just keep trolling the Google News line for a big article about Coumadin or Warfarin because if these trials are done, which I think they will be, and if they're successful, it'll be published, it'll be vetted through the normal medical quality control process, and at that point, there may be some comfort saying standard of care has now changed. Until then, you really want to do standard of care. It's the only ethical thing to do. Young man back there, right? This is my nephew. What would you say the most dangerous to drug is to take? I <laughs> There are a lot of dangerous drugs to take, but I think uh, any drug that you weren't prescribed by your doctor <laughs> or, given, or given by your mother, my sister, <laughs> is too dangerous to consider. Good question. Excellent question. Yes. Um, thank you for the talk. And I want to ask about, do you have any insights about avian flu? Because Southeast Asian co governments are now buying mega loads of rival virin, but in the news we say that this doesn't work so well. So do you have any insight about it? Yes. Yeah, so, so the thing about pharmacogenomics, first from a narrow pharmacogenomics perspective, you have to have some people who do well on a drug to even raise the possibility that it might be generic, genetic variation. For some of these new emerging diseases, we just don't have any drugs that work at all. And so the question of genetic variation is kind of a secondary question. We need to find something that works well for somebody. So I'm not an expert on avian flu. I, ribovirin has a long history in other settings. We use it for some liver uh, uh, hepatitis and things like this. So it doesn't surprise me, since hepatitis virus is significantly different from avian, that our current antivirals that have been in general developed for specific viruses that are not avian flu will either be totally ineffective or will only be a glancing blow. The good news is there are a lot of highly motivated people to try to find um, new medications that will be direct, um, kind of designed specifically for avian flu. And um, judging from the AIDS story, where we went from no drugs to a pretty powerful set of drugs, um, I think that if this gets sufficient attention, funding, priority from the governments who care, I think that we've now shown that we can do it, uh, as in the case of AIDS. But I think right now we're just trying anything in the laundry box anything in the medicine box, just to see if we can get it to work. Yes. Thank you for the talk. Um, I, was, I was curious if you think uh, the, the genomics work is leading to anything in the computer area uh, that could be a language or a logic uh, or an approach to become, begin to be uh, predictive uh, and help us better understand it through modeling. So do you mean using the genome as a model for computation? And perhaps even creating a language around the uh, dynamics of the genome. So in many ways, the genome is a language. Uh, and in fact, I have uh, a, fr a very good uh, colleague from University of Pennsylvania who wrote some papers in the early 80s 
thinking, saying, if we use some of the techniques of linguistics to analyze the genome, we'll get pretty far. And so he took some of the things they use for natural language text interpretation, and he translated them into biological programs, which were actually very effective, for example, at reading genes. So that, that is, in some, to some extent, already happening. Um, because if you think about it, the DNA sequence of letters is very similar to the sequence of letters in a book. And so a lot of the things that linguistics, li, 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 what is somebody who does linguistics? A linguists, uh, a lot of the techniques that linguists have developed are actually directly applicable to the, to the analysis of DNA sequences. Um, so uh, if, if you send me an email, I can point you to some of that literature if you're interested. So order makes a difference? Order definitely makes a difference. Uh, is there a percentage of the population that uh, do not get the benefits of a drug, but get predominantly the side effects? Yes, and, and, and we're only beginning to uncover that rock, take that rock. But for example, that codeine one, I didn't make it up. There are people who get terrible, terrible constipation and no salutary pain relief. And my fear is that there's a lot of, 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 um, of examples like that. Uh, this is one of the main things we want to learn, and so you have to dissect each of the effects, the, the proteins that are involved, and what, which variations they have. Many of the effects of drugs involve hundreds of proteins, so you can imagine hundreds of different combinations, and that's why it really is not the case that one size fits all, because it may be that everybody gets a different size. The examples that I gave you today, there are two or three sizes, but there are going to be cases, I think diabetes, depression, where there might be tens or hundreds of different sizes, that is to say, versions of the genome that require different treatments. Thank you for your enlightened talk. I'm from India. Uh, this is about pneumocilides. I know in the West, pneumocilides have been uh, banned because of liver toxicity, while in India we still use them. And um, uh, most of the doctors uh, find that uh, they've never found any case of liver failure or death due to liver failure. So could you please comment on this? Yeah, so I'm not an expert on that particular class of drugs, but this would fall slightly under my previous answer, which is it, it also depends on the frequency of the disease. I should have mentioned that as part of my answer. If you're in an area that has a lot of malaria, you might accept malaria drugs that are not so safe because you have a population that you need to save and you need a lot of different tools to combat malaria. Whereas in the United States, where we don't have that much malaria, we don't really need to have a big armamentarium of drugs against malaria. So part of the calculation that any local FDA type organization makes is what is the burden of disease on our society? What are the, what are the drugs that we have available to us? And are our physicians comfortable using those drugs? So a drug that might be very dangerous in my hands because I never use it might be very safe in the hands of an Indian doctor who uses it all the time. Because they learn, oh, if the patient turns green, I better stop the drug. I don't know that. So, you, but I'm, I'm, uh, that was obviously an exaggeration. But you do learn the effects of the drugs, and you become a little bit of an expert on them. And that is a really big factor in the comfort level of physicians using different drugs. These are very good questions. And one of the things I've been thinking about, I'm a pediatrician. Actually, a neonatologist take care of critically ill babies. Think about the challenges with babies. Um, they may be sterile in the beginning and get colonized variably over time. They also have different uh, enzymes that are being expressed in different amounts, modified in different ways. So everything that's true about all of you may not be true for the babies. Absolutely. L let me just say a little bit more about that. First of all, one of your fellows we're doing a collaboration with, Yair, uh, who's great. Uh, I, I don't know if he's here. Um, He's interested in looking at the effects of some drugs that might be passed from the mom to the baby through the placenta, and then that might have some side effects on the baby later on. And he's interested in the genetic differences between the mom, because imagine that the mom has a certain genetic background so that she needs to take lots of the drug. So she has huge, very high blood levels, and that's the good thing for her because she needs a lot in order to for it to work. But then that passes through the baby who might have inherited dad's genetics or have no genetics at all yet, so to speak. Uh, and therefore, the baby is getting an overdose. And so we're looking at these kinds of questions. I should say that, um, as you may know, lots of drug companies use mice, not drug companies, but also academic institutions. We do experiments on mice and rats. But for pharmacogenetics, especially with regard to the liver, 
it's really dangerous to use mice and rats because mice and rats have been eating different stuff from us for the last 60 million years. Hopefully you'll be happy to learn that if you've ever seen what a rat and a mice eat. Well, that means that their detoxification system is totally different from ours. So even though a lot of their physiology is shared with us, that part of it is one of the most different things. And so it's very frustrating for drug companies because it could be safe in a mouse, safe in a pig, safe in a dog, and then it's not safe in a human. And it's because all of those four species just simply don't eat the same thing. One of the amazing things that's going on is people are trying to genetically engineer a mouse that has a human liver. That's exciting to me because that allows me to check drugs on a more human-like liver system. And so therefore it's interesting. And if that succeeds, it, it could be great. Uh, the other thing to say about the, the, the young babies is the liver changes over life, and the liver enzymes you have when you're a neonate uh, over the first years of life totally change. And so a lot of the pharmacogenetics we're learning are really for adults, and we're going to have to redo the studies in order to treat babies uh, appropriately. I, I have a question about uh, your research in coumadin warfarin um, most patients who are on warfarin are also on many other medications. They're yes. not only on that alone. And my concern is, practically, how can you, what is your research looking at the future of uh, the drug-to-drug -drug interaction with Coumadin? Coumadin interacts, as you know, with yes. multiple drugs, and that's the concern. Uh, my, my next concern is, for example, I'll give an example. I would worry about my patients if they take anti-malarial drugs on Coumadin, they go travel in some exotic places where there's no medical care. There's no way you can get um, a PT or an INR. And the question is, in the future, how can we go about not worrying sick about patients uh, yes. up in the you know, uh, exotic remote place somewhere? And so practically, um, the direction of, of warfarin and um, the future of how we can clinically monitor patients better. Great. So the first question is a great one. It was about interacting drugs. I, I mentioned that when you eat stuff, it can change the levels of different uh, proteins, and therefore it affects the, the ecosystem of your liver, and therefore your liver might behave differently. And in fact, in our work with warfarin, one of the reasons that made it so hard to get these 10 or 15 groups together is we had to get what other drugs are these patients on. And in some cases, we had to go back to the patients. And they're on a million drugs, but we picked the five or six really big ones you know, cholesterol drugs, the other ones that you might imagine they would be on. Uh, amiodarone is a big one. That I won't go into the details. So we are collecting because part of that computer algorithm that will spit out the dose will not only be what your genetics are, what your weight is, maybe your gender, but it'll be what other drugs are you on. Um, and so we'll try to cover that. And we're going to have a lot of sub-analyses, which will hopefully be uh, appropriate. And then we'll do the trial, and we'll see, see if it works. Your second question is a really hard one. Um, when somebody's environment changes, they're in Palo Alto, they're eating a, a constant amount of salad every week, it's a, it's a physician's dream, and then they say, Doc, I'm going to Belize and I'm going to eat whatever's growing on the trees. Uh, all bets are off, really, as you know. And in that case, one of the pieces of advice, depending on how important the Coumadin is, maybe a trip to Belize, maybe not so much. Uh, but if this is important for your life, all I can do is tell you what the risks are. And you know, you do this all, it sounds like you do this all the time at, with, with the patients. But uh, predicting how the environment will change and how that will change the drug response, maybe we'll get there someday. Um, maybe if we say, if you're going to England, well, they won't be eating any vegetables. <laughs> so we can, we, can, uh, incre we can lower the dose of the Coumadin right off the bat. But other than those gross generalities, you're going to be in, you're going to have to work hard. Is it possible for a person's uh, genes or DNA to change over a lifetime? Very good question. One moment. Over your life, does your DNA change? And in the simple view of the genome, it's constant. But of course, that's not really true. Um, there are changes to your DNA that we're just beginning to understand. It's not so much the DNA sequence itself that changes, but um, DNA is packaged in the cell. And how it's packaged and how tightly it's packaged so that some things are easy to get to on the sequence and other things are hard to get to on the sequence, that changes with environment based on your lifestyle and it changes with age. 
So in a sense, your effective genome, that is to say the genome that you really have access to, definitely changes over time, even if the actual DNA bases don't change that much. And so that's called epigenetics. It's a name that they've given this field. And it's very active because it seems to be very important for a number of chronic diseases. And therefore, that's why you can't just cure them, because there's been changes made to how it's packaged, and you have to figure out how to change that packaging, which is tough. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, I was curious uh, what kind of uh, light <clears throat> is shed on uh, antibiotics with this kind of research. Ah. And then secondly, <clears throat> I wanted to know uh, if you were wearing that hat when the officer uh, pulled you over. To answer the second question first, I was in fact wearing the hat in the middle of the back seat, and in retrospect, this might have been a clue that there were too many people in the back seat. Uh, I love this hat. I was told it would be very sunny, which it was earlier, and, and uh, I, I was a visiting scholar at the University of Wyoming at Laramie, and it's a real Stetson, and I never get to wear it, and, but with the sun, I thought maybe this would be a good... Uh... So your first question was a great question about what about antibiotics, and there it's, it's a nightmare <laughs> because we're talking about two genomes now. We're talking about the genome of the patient and how they're going to modify the drug, you're also talking about the genome of the bacteria or the virus that the drug is going to be going after. And that virus or, or bacteria might have a different, it has its own ecology and its own, you know, e, all E. coli are not the same. They have genetic variation just like we do. And so now you're looking at the interaction of two genomes. I should add that that's the case with cancer too, because when you get cancer, your cancer cells they're derived from your genome, but the genome has changed. And so you're talking about the regular host genome as well as the invading, so to speak, cancer genome. And in this case, you're also worrying about... So there's been a lot of work done in the pharmacogenetics of AIDS because there's now people... My, my colleague Bob Schaefer here at, at the medical school... Uh, I point over there because that's where he sits. I'm sorry. He's not here today. Um, Bob ha is an HIV doctor, and before he prescribes a drug he actually looks at the DNA sequence of the HIV virus, and that tells him which drugs are likely to work better than others. And you can do this for bacteria as well. He hasn't even gotten yet. They're just beginning to look at the human side and say, what about that side and the variability there? So this is a big growth area, um, and especially in HIV and certain types of tuberculosis as well. They're looking at the genome of the tuberculosis to pick the drugs that work best. Yes. Thank you for an excellent talk. I wanted to ask... I know you. <laughs> we got another plant did. in the audience. <laughs> well, this is a serious question. We've all witnessed the horror that thalidomide in some women created. And teratogenic drugs are recognized. You're a powerful man with powerful databases. Would you explain to us how things have changed? in relationship to teratogenic problems? Well, well, let me answer that question more generally, which is, you know, thalidomide was used in the, I guess, 50s um, as, for, for, um, as an anti-nausea drug. It worked great as an anti-nausea drug for pregnant women, but it had this terrible side effect, which is that there were children born without limbs or with deformed limbs, and they clearly realized, oh my goodness. Um, and, 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 and in a sense, Vioxx is a similar story where a good drug seems to be great, and all of a sudden, there's this terrible bad thing that makes you either withdraw it or consider withdrawing it. And why does this happen, you could say? And it's really a question of statistics. When drug companies get a drug approved, it's usually based on a study that has 1,000 to a 5,000, maybe 10,000 people. So if you have a 1 in 10,000 side effect, you're probably not going to see it, or maybe you'll only see it once in 10,000 people. But now you sell it, and now millions of people are taking it, and a 1 in 10,000 side effect for a million people is hundreds and hundreds, if not more, um, examples. And so the FDA does what they call post-marketing surveillance. Once a drug makes it onto the market, it's not the end of the story. The, the company that put the drug out needs to follow that drug as tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people take it, and they have to 
look at reports and uh, they have a, a, primi a relatively primitive, so the answer to your question, the reporting system is terrible. And this needs to be fixed, and I, don't, I won't get on my, on my high horse, but we see lots of side effects, and physicians in general, not because they're bad people, they're just too busy to fill out an, a paper report to the FDA that they had a side effect. So I estimate that one in 1,000 or one in 10,000 side effects are even captured and sent to the FDA. So you can imagine how many millions of people have to take a drug, have a side effect, and then get it reported before it comes to the attention of the FDA. I think information systems are the answer to this. I think that if we can have information systems where people have an electronic medical record, where when the doctor puts in your medications and your current side effects, so to speak, that goes to some kind of database that is watching and says, wait a minute, we have too many whatevers with this drug, let's, let's have an investigation. And I think there's a major opportunity to improve healthcare by, by doing better monitoring of drug effects. So the answer to your question is since the 1940s, it really hasn't improved and we still need to see millions of people getting thousands of side effects before it occurs to us that there's a connection. In the back. Thank, thank you for your very great talk. I'm, my major is pharmacy and I'm from South Korea. And uh, I've learned that a uh, lot of population uh, has have different genes, as you said, and I wonder how c how the researchers can make the integrated of pharmacokinetics. Mm. I'm optimistic, so I, I need this is very important to stress. First of all, that all ethnic groups show the same variations, and mo for the most part. And the only differences are in the frequencies of those. Uh, so some people might have more of one type and other, but we see them in all populations. And this really goes to the out of Africa. We've all descended from a common little clan of, of people. Um, and, and that's an important first point, somewhat irrelevant to your question. Uh, but the, in terms of my feeling about um, globally relevant pharmacogenetic kind of dosing criteria, in the case of warfarin, we know that the doses may on average be higher in one place and lower in another place because of the prevalence of the different gen genetics. But we believe now that as long as we've identified the right genes, we still should be able to apply the same equation to different groups. So what that means is some groups may have on average a slightly lower because they have different frequencies of the different genes, uh, gene variants, and others might be slightly higher but we do believe that there should be kind of a global equation, so to speak, for figuring out the dose of warfarin. Now, I'm saying this, and it's right now it's a matter of faith, and I could be wrong, in which case we might have to have population-specific um, uh, dosing. And that's not horrible, although that's not the first choice. You, uh, maybe it, I was making a joke about England and vegetables, but maybe it's the fact that because of the differences in the diet between the U.S. and England, People who are cousins, who live, one, or even let's take twins, identical twins. One lives in England, one lives in um, U.S. They have exactly the same genetics. It may be because of the difference in diets and maybe the difference in the bacteria that have colonized their intestine, they will still need slightly different doses. So this all will remain to be seen by these, uh, by these clinical trials. I'm hoping that those effects are relatively small compared to the effect of the genetics, but we haven't proven that yet. It's probably related to the warm beer in England. Yeah. Warm uh, beer is another variable. <laughs> That's right. Um, I'd like to thank him again for his presentation. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.